So, welcome to the seventh lecture, and Professor Bhatt would continue uh, the uh, discussing localization in the quantum Hall regime. And again, just speak in the microphone so that the questions can also get recorded. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks to all of you for coming uh, for the seventh lecture. Um, as I promised in the last lecture, we are now transiting from three-dimensional systems to not just two-dimensional systems, but two-dimensional systems that are uh, placed in a large magnetic field where the physics is quite different. And it's actually quite interesting to uh, see the contrast. And since the title of the series is from single particle to many body localization, uh, I will talk about many body localization mostly in this regime. Uh, as an example. Um, so let me um, sort of give you an overview of this lecture. Uh, first, I'm going to give an introduction to the integer quantum Hall effect. Uh, uh, I apologize to people who were also here for the morning lecture, which, uh, which had the same uh, introductory part. So I will, uh, basically talk about three things there. Um, just general two-dimensional electrons in a perpendicular magnetic field and the integer quantum Hall effect. And then I'll talk about critical behavior at integer quantum Hall transitions for non-interacting electrons. As the speaker this morning emphasized, we don't really know whether the non-interacting electron model is appropriate for real electrons at these integer quantum Hall transition, that uh, is a, a question that still needs to be addressed. Um, uh, but this will concentrate only on non-interacting electrons. And then I will talk about numerical methods for studying these pla uh, plateau transitions between different integer quantum Hall states. Uh, and I call them non-topological methods because this is just conventional uh, methods using strip geometry, uh, which I talked about under Anderson localization, but I will give some more examples of how this is done in the quantum Hall regime. And then I will concentrate uh, quite a bit on understanding qu topological quantum numbers associated with eigenstates in the quantum Hall regime. These are known as churn numbers. And so I will uh, go through this description of what happens to wave functions when you have electrons in the lowest Landau level, because as soon as you put on a big magnetic field, uh, and if it's large enough, all the electrons go into the lowest Landau level where their kinetic energy is quenched. And the only uh, energy in the problem, if you're not having the electrons interact, is the disorder potential that is there invariably present in any experimental system. And I'll introduce the Chern number, uh, talk about its physical interpretation and its relation to the Hall conductance of uh, contribution due to that uh, uh, eigenstate. And then I'll describe a method which is very different from the conventional methods to, uh, to determine the localization length exponent near an integer quantum Hall trans plateau transition. And this involves looking at non-zero churn number states, eigenstates. We're talking about one electron physics, so he, there's an eigenstate for each electron. And we look at the properties of those uh, eigenstates. And from those properties and simply their topological character, we are able to actually get the exponent of the localization length at the quantum Hall uh, plateau transitions. And then I'll also show that the same kind of method uh, can be used to, uh, uh, to answer other questions. In particular, um, a, a, you know, a question as to what happens when you go to low magnetic fields, because we know that in zero magnetic field with pure potential scattering in two dimensions, all eigenstates for non-interacting electrons are localized. So you don't have any extended states in that system. And how does the quantum Hall picture merge into that? And then finally, I'll 
a, also do apply it to 2D electrons in a random magnetic field, which is a bit of a, you know, more of a theorist's uh, problem. It's not something that the experimentalists can do, but it's also worthwhile looking at that uh, case. So that is the uh, basic plan for today's uh, lecture. So we'll start with the, uh, with the first one, which is basically introduction to the integer quantum Hall effect. So when you have two dimensional electrons in a perpendicular magnetic field, uh, the constant density of states that you have, which is uh, shown here, here's energy, there's the density of states, and it's constant at zero magnetic field. As soon as you put on a magnetic field, this constant density of state splits into Landau levels, which are fixed energies that are separated by an energy H bar omega C. And omega C is proportional to the magnetic field. Omega C is EB over MC. I will be using both the word symbol B and the symbol H for magnetic field. And there's no difference between what those two things. If you're talking about uh, non-magnetic materials with no, uh, uh, no difference between B, there, there's no induced magnetization, if you will. Okay. Now these are, in a clean system, you get these Landau levels, which are separated by H bar omega C, and you can make H bar omega C as large as you want by increasing the magnetic field. It also turns out that the number of states in each Landau level is not only proportional to area, it's also proportional to the magnetic field. So you can get more and more electrons in, in the Landau levels as you increase the magnetic field. So as you increase the magnetic field, you can actually in a experimental system with a constant number of electrons, the electrons first have a continuum of energies, then they occupy a lot of Landau levels, then the number of Landau levels shrinks as the magnetic field goes up. And finally, you can, at high enough fields, all the electrons could be in the lowest Landau level. And what we will uh, show is that, um, that in fact, if, you, if there is disorder present, and we will represent most disorder by a white noise potential of a certain uh, width, so width is taken to be much smaller than the Landau uh, the cyclotron energy H bar omega C. So we don't mix Landau level, we just stay within one Landau level. And in particular, what's going to happen is we're going to study only the lowest Landau level, this one. Assume that the field is so large that all the electrons are in that Landau level, which has been disorder broadened in some way. Okay. Now, uh, as one sees in experiment, uh, when you take such a sample, and so here is uh, the, the same plot that was shown this morning in this morning's lecture is you take a typical whole bar sample, you uh, pass current in one direction, put a, uh, and you can measure the, the potential transfers. You can measure the potential longitudinally and the magnetic field is out of the plane. Uh, so it's in the third direction. And when you do that, um, if you look at the Hall resistance, which is just defined as uh, Hall voltage divided by current, and you look at the longitudinal resistance, which is the longitudinal voltage divided by the current, you get these green and red curves that are shown here. The red one shows these big plateaus, that those are the quantized integer Hall effect, uh, which is H over N E squared. Uh, um, the values are, and these values are incredibly accurate with good sample, reasonably good samples. You can get this to be correct to 10 digits or so at low temperatures. And so in fact, this particular uh, number, the conductance uh, or uh, unit of resistance H over E squared, which is some 25,800 ohms is so perfectly constant that a, three years ago, it became a metrological standard. We don't need the meter in France or the kilogram in France anymore. Everything is defined in terms of the quantum Hall effect plus some atomic problem, uh, measurements. And so we have length, uh, 
weight, everything defined in these terms. So they, this, is, this is how constant this one is. It is, um, that's what I want to emphasize. Now these plateaus happen at H over N E squared for the all resistance. And between plateaus, the resistance, uh, the whole resistance changes. And technically the, the belief is that at zero temperature, it actually just, there's a pre precipitous step at one energy or one magnetic field. But at finite temperature, you find that this uh, step is actually broadened by a certain amount. And that broadening actually measures the nature of the electronic states that are there in this system. Another point that's very important to realize is that disorder is really important in this, in this thing. If you'd have no disorder whatsoever, if you imagine a pristine two-dimensional electron gas, uh, you will find that you, you should get um, a Hall resistance, which is just linear in the magnetic field. And so getting those steps, one needs to have disorder. And these samples are actually reasonably disordered by today's standard, um, something like uh, several tens of thousand in centimeters square per volt second mobility, whereas now we have millions, 40 million available uh, with very pure samples. Okay. So what actually you see is here are two um, data points uh, showing how the longitudinal resistivity at the step. So if you notice the longitudinal resistivity at the step, uh, that's the green curve here is really a peak. It's longitudinal resistivity zero elsewhere. And then it's, it peaks up at that. And you can look at how the peak changes with, with temperature. And that's what you see here is what you find of the data from three different uh, temperatures on the left side. Uh, 4.2 Kelvin, 1.3 Kelvin, 0.35 Kelvin is some early data, and 1988. Uh, and you see that the, uh, the peak sharpen up as you, as you lower the temperature. And they're consistent with the peak going to zero width in the zero temperature limit. Uh, you can actually plot this um, peak width as a function of temperature. Um, uh, in fact, this is the opposite. This is the slope that is being plotted as a function at the, at the midpoint being plotted as a function of temperature on a log log plot. And what you find is that these log log plots are uh, fitted by um, a functional form T to the minus kappa. Uh, and similarly, the width of the peak is also is fitted with the form uh, delta B goes as T to the plus kappa, and the kappa that is obtained from these uh, experiments is 0 0.42 with an error bar of about 10%. So these are again, early measurements. So we'll see how this kappa is related to the nature of eigenstates in this system. Here is somewhat more recent data uh, from 2005. It's again from the same group. All, both of these are from Dan Sui's group um, and, uh, at Princeton. And again, you see that how the plateau transition here in this case, the plateau transition is from, from uh, the third Landau level to the fourth Landau level. And you find that the step from one to the other is um, become sharper as you lower the temperature. And again, the same story, you go ahead and do that. And you find that this slope as a function of temperature is a power law with a power law exponent of 0.42 as in the previous data. Okay. Um, I should point out that this only holds for certain kinds of samples. There are other samples which don't quite fit this picture. And that uh, issue is uh, still not quite resolved as to why that is happening. But the, uh, the reason why this was done was because um, Dan Sui felt that one should try and do short range disorder, not have a 
because if you're going to do disorder because of remote impurities, which are giving a potential, then that, that's a long range kind of variation of the potential. And maybe that long range nature might be, uh, might mess up the experimental data. So in this case, he actually used alloy disorder in the sample to, to try and get very short range uh, potential. And this X equals 0.85% is basically the alloy concentration in the gallium arsenide system. Another thing that you can do is you can actually look at the temperature dependence of the peak width for different sizes, okay? And this is from a German group, Hoch et al. And again, you see the uh, peak width um, as a function of temperature on a log-log plot seems to go up as a power law. But one other thing that you notice is that depending on the size of the sample, these are small samples from 10 microns to 64 microns, you see that the 64 micron sample gives the data down to lower temperatures. And whereas the um, you know, 10 micron sample saturates at uh, something like 100 or 120 mill, millikelvin. It's coming down and then it saturates. And the understanding is that when, you, when it saturates, uh, you are not really looking at the localization length of the electronic wave function because it has reached the size of your sample. And so you can actually look at directly the, uh, from, the, from the saturation, you can also determine what is, what is happening. Uh, there's a third way of doing it, which is you can put on an electric field and see uh, saturation because of elect finite electric field effects. And that is yet another way of it. So there are actually, it turns out that there are uh, the natural quantity that the experiment measures is a combination of the localization length exponent and the dynamical exponent Z, it's the product. But you can extract the two by doing these various different experiments. And, uh, uh, and that, that's how you experiments get the, uh, localization length exponent is by combining several experiments and separately extracting Z nu and then Z um, as a result of that. So schematically, this is the picture that one has in, uh, for non-interacting electrons. Is that the density of states is some, I mean, I've drawn a semicircle, but that's just stylized the thing. There's no reason for the density of states to be semicircle, but it just was easy to draw that. Uh, and the idea was at that time, the feeling was the so-called extended states at any given temperature were those states that had a localization length scale that was larger than any you know, inelastic length scale in the problem. Um, and so uh, the true zero temperature result uh, is exactly this. But one can ask the question, and that was uh, certainly in the early days, uh, the question was asked, uh, is there really an extended band inside the Landau level. We know now much better that uh, that is not something that one would expect because if that were the case, then the uh, step would stop uh, uh, becoming a step. It would, because of extended states in the middle of the band. So the true picture is the one that is drawn on the right, that there is only a, one critical energy at which the localization length will diverge in a, and, and the divergence of the localization length is shown here it, for a symmetric potential disorder, equally positive or negative, which is usually not in experiment, but more in, you can do it in numerics, you can do it in theory, uh, because that's something that's easier to handle, okay? Um, all right, now that does not mean, and this was something that was misunderstood for many, many years in the early days. They thought that it meant that there was a single state at the center of the band that was delocalized. Everything else was localized. That is not true. And we, I'll show you explicitly through numerical calculation of the, that that kind of a picture is wrong. It is actually a lot of states, but they go in the thermodynamic limit, they are at, this, uh, at the energy E equal to zero. 
So if you want to actually look at uh, eigenstates, you can take a, this, you can model this system, you can add a random white noise potential and um, diagonalize and get the eigenstates. So here is actually work done by Bodo Huckestein and, and Ludwig Schweitzer in 1992, showing what is the local density, that is a wave function, since it's a complex wave function, this is a, um, a complex emission um, eigenvalue problem. And if you uh, look at the density of electron it, uh, corresponding to that eigenfunction, that is psi r squared, um, and that's what it looks like. It's very, very complicated. It is what's known as multifractal state. It has peaks, and then there are peaks within, you know, you get rid of the top peaks, and then you'll find smaller peaks, and then you'll find smaller peaks, even smaller, et cetera, et cetera. And if you really wanted to analyze, uh, you wanted to describe this wave function, it has to be done in terms of multifractals. And that's a whole um, sort of subject in itself. I won't go into that. I just wanted to show you what this wave function looks like. It's not a very simple plane wave like uh, wave function at all. It's uh, very complicated. And the precise nature does depend on the disorder, uh, precise disorder that you have, but statistical properties are the same. On that. No, 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 I don't mean that. I mean that the Precise geometry of this uh, depends on the disorder. That's all. So as long as the disorder is not at the scale of the magnetic lens, uh, yeah, uh, factor dimension, etc., etc., are all the same, right? Exactly. If you, that's what I said. If you take any statistical property based using this wave function, you'll get the same answer. Uh, what do you mean by nature of the disorder? Sure, if you, if you make it correlated uh, with a power law correlation and you know, the small enough power law exponent, there will be changes, of course. So the, all of this is assumes that the disorder is, has finite correlation length or most of, the, most of the numerics is actually done with zero correlation length, white noise. Now, for those of you who might be interested in doing, uh, pursuing this, uh, my, you should, there are, there are some words of warning. White noise potential works perfectly in the lowest Landau level. It turns out in the upper Landau levels, it is not a good uh, random this thing. You want to put something that has a finite extent, not zero extent. And uh, I can discuss that with anyone who's interested, but that's, that's a technical point that it, it turns out that uh, Landau level, it's only the lowest Landau level where you can, uh, you can model with the white noise potential and, and everything is well behaved. So how do you actually extract the localization length? And this I'm going back to a slide that, that I had uh, shown when I was talking about Anderson localization because the same method is used there, which uh, is... Right. Uh, so if I think about the number of zero energy states that the center extended, right. So then that that's not one, but that's right. like a, a vanishing fraction of the states. Right. Uh, so does the exact number of zero modes uh, or the extended state depend on the disorder? So I can think that for a given system, like say a one fifty six or one fifty six, that they just change around the disorder. Sure, That's of course. Right. That, of course, if you have a finite size system, how many states are uh, clustered around the zero energy uh, can can precisely where they are clustered is also it may vary a little bit. But now, but if I take the system like the number, uh, yeah, the number then the number is uh, is is fixed in the sense that it it goes to a certain average number. I'll I'll show you that data. In fact, I'll show you that data. Okay, so one of the most used methods for finding out localization length for any, whether it's a three-dimensional system or a two-dimensional system, is to start with a two-dimensional system. So in this case, it's a two-dimensional system. So you start with a square. Uh, 
and then you extend this length. So there is one length scale on out here, which uh, let me see if I have the second slide in there or not. No, I don't have the second slide. All right, then I, I'm free to use what I want. So let me assume this has M um, um, eigen, uh, effectively M wide, and this length L is going to go to infinity. And what you do is you try and find out the localization length for this finite width one dimensional strip. It, in the end, it becomes one dimensional because only one direction is going to infinity. The other direction is finite, okay? And so the way you do that is you, you write down the wave function on here and at the next uh, site, uh, site. And then you use the transfer matrix, which is basically that, uh, if you know the Hamiltonian of the system, you know what, and you're looking, deciding what the energy is that you're trying to um, model, then you get the transfer matrix is just given by this, uh, this combination right here. And you can, starting with these two, you can then get the next two, et cetera, et cetera, and you can keep on going. And then what you do is you look at the transfer matrix product of all these TIs, and of course, what's going to happen is that some eigenvalues are big and some are small. So you, you start getting more and more of one eigenvalue compared to the other, but you have to, um, in that case, look at this, uh, this average that is basically the product matrix multiplied by its complex conjugate to the power one over two N where N is the number of transfer matrices that you have multiplied and look at the limit and going to infinity of the eigenvalues of that matrix gamma. And the eigenvalues are exponential, are represented as exponentials of what I call Lyapunov exponents, gamma one to gamma two M in this case. And the um, inverse uh, correlation length is the minimum of these Lyapunov exponents. So you do this procedure, you go ahead and find out the minimum eigenvalue uh, gamma i, and the inverse of that is the localization length. It tells you what is the longest length scale in the problem. Everything is decaying, but the longest length scale of the decay is the one that's the localization length. Now, this is well-defined because there's a mathematical theorem that in one dimension with any disorder, you always have eigenstates with finite localization length. So there is no problem. You're not going to get any you know, zeros or stuff like that. You're going to get some small number, but you're going to get, it's always going to be finite. So basically the, of course, now the decay length, since you have a parameter M in here, the width of your sample, the decay length will depend on M because it's an M by infinity problem, not a one by infinity uh, uh, one dimensional system. And so the expectation is that lambda M over M will be some universal function of M divided by, uh, by the actual localization length. So first I'm showing you what the actual data looks like without without any massaging. You just look at lambda M over M and plot it versus M for different uh, M's. I don't know how he did 0.5, but that's, you know, this is actually a continuum problem. So therefore I think the M stands for uh, the ratio of the size of the, of the system and the magnetic length. So going from 0.5 to 64, what you find is you get a series of curves that depend on the energy that you have, okay? So the topmost curve, which is, which is that one right there, is coming at energy um, uh, 0.01. That's, that's this one right here, 0.01, all right? And then at 0.05 is the next curve, then the next curve, then the next curve. Now, if these were all localized, 
then all these curves should actually go down as M increases for every energy. But you notice that there is a little bit of a non-monotonicity for near the center of the band. At least the, there's non-monotonicity for small M. So you have to throw that data away because basically that's saying that these are very strongly finite size limited data. And so we are not going to expect long distance physics to come out of that. But what you can do is you can take the data for larger M, for energies, um, you know, you don't want to be far away from the center of the band either because you don't expect the asymptotic behavior of the localization length to be true for all energies. It is only near the center of the band that it is true. So you have to play this um, delicate balance of keeping the lowest energies where you think the data is reliable. Uh, if you could go to much larger M, then even 0.01 would work. Uh, and in this case, it probably works beyond about four or eight, but does, it doesn't do a great job. So let me show you what exactly in the end uh, it's done. Uh, what you take is you take the data that you have, and then you say that depending on the energy, there is a localization length psi. And how I'm going to determine the psi as a function of energy is I'm going to make sure that all of those data lie on a single curve. So for each energy, so there are all these different curves that we have, uh, this one and this one and that one and that one. I'm going to assume that psi has a certain value such that when I divide it m by psi, all these curves will collapse into one. And you can see immediately that that's not really going to happen out here because this is an upward bending curve and this is a downward bending curve. So no matter how much collapse you do, it's not going to fit. So that tells you where you're uh, limited by finite size, okay? But a lot of the data uh, does seem to fit one single curve. And then of course, what you do is then you plot your psi that you determine by forcing all the curves to lie on top of each other versus energy on a log log plot. And that's the inset right here with right this one. And then this slope of this curve tells you what is the, how it goes. And this is work done by Huckerstein and Kramer. And they found that psi goes like E minus EC to the minus two point. The original work was 2.34 plus minus 0.02, I believe. So that is how you uh, determine it. Now, uh, those of you who might have attended this morning's lecture, there are many more day, uh, works that are very similar to Hukerstein and Kramer, but they go to bigger sizes. They analyze the data a little bit more sophisticated where they allow for irrelevant variables and then get psi of E. And the claim is in the latest set of papers that some, I would like to be, uh, I'm not exactly sure what I should write, but it's certainly there, this is, the answers are 2.6 with, with probably not more than 0.05 away from that. There are lots and lots of different groups that have got that. So, no, this is all numerics. There is no, so there is work done by uh, Martin Zern Zernbauer, who is actually claiming that this exponent actually is infinity and it's logarithmically dependent on the length size. Of course, numerics will never get that. Um, I think we, I would say most numerics don't actually agree with that. If the coefficient, if there is a logarithmic dependence, the coefficient of the logarithm is very small. 
and so uh, so small that it is uh, not numerically really detectable. And so I'm not really sure that's, uh, that, that that field theory that uh, Zernbauer has is the final word. Yeah, the, right, yeah. I'm with, he showed that it's very peculiar in the quantum Hall regime, yes. So I want to actually tackle the problem slightly differently because um, when you take the data like this, you're actually taking a two-dimensional problem and converting it into a one-dimensional problem. And so there are many fitting parameters that you have. You first have to extract the localization length for your one-dimensional system, then see how it scales with the size of the width of the system, and then extrapolate to get the answer. So there's a lot of jugglery that's involved there. In addition, more recent data that said that this number is actually not right, but this number is more right, um, required Try not just to go as that, but there are corrections to that, which are subleading. Okay. And of course, if you have more parameters and you have numerical data with some uncertainty, with some error bars, you can fit the data and get different results. After all, the data has only finite fidelity. You can, uh, if you put in lots of parameters, you can get uh, many things. So that's a, that's a real issue that I think needs to be uh, sorted out. So we decided uh, some years ago that we should really try and understand these eigenfunctions from a different point of view. And so I'm going to talk about a paper that I, I wrote with Dana Rovas and Duncan Haldane in 1980s uh, when we first started understanding these wave functions. And then um, what that, that led us to a way to estimate the localization length exponent. And I'll describe that, that method. So this is a very different method. It's only going to talk about two dimensional systems. So it's L by L. And then we are gonna change L, okay? And see how properties uh, change as, a si as the size L changes, and then try to extrapolate to L equals infinity. But we are not going to change the dimension of the system. It's gonna remain two dimensional. And there's some other things that are, uh, that are very interesting about this, the, me the method that we're doing, okay. So in order to do that, I want to try and uh, go through the nature of the wave functions in the lowest Landau level. Uh, in the lowest Landau level, the eigenfunctions are some analytic polynomial function of the uh, complex, coordinate z, which is x plus i, y, x and y are the coordinates of the electron. And if you create the complex coordinate z, x plus i, y, then all the wave functions, single particle wave function, they're just function of one variable, are functions of z times the Gaussian factor e to the minus magnitude of z squared over four L squared, where L is the magnetic length. And L is uh, square root of e b. Uh, Oh, sorry, um, the length goes down as the magnetic field goes up. So it goes as one over square root of h. Okay. Now, suppose you have a periodic geometry rather than infinite space. Okay, so I'm now talking about a two dimensional sample L by L. And of course I can talk about very large L, uh, L and that's, that's represented by that wave function. But if you have a finite sample, you can put in periodic boundary conditions. Okay, you can imagine you, but you can put it periodic boundary condition with a twist angle, because this is a, uh, you know, if you were talking about Anderson model, you can put periodic boundary condition or anti-periodic boundary condition. That is, you change the sign of the wave function when you stitch them together. And actually that's one way of finding out conductance of a sample. Since here it's a complex Hermitian problem, you can have any phase angle, e to the i theta. So there'll be an e to the i theta x for this one and another e to the i theta y for that. And, but 
because um, the magnetic translation operator as defined there uh, uh, commutes with the Hamiltonian. Uh, and, but the magnetic translation operators don't commute among themselves. So in a sense, it looks like Bloch's theorem in, for crystal structures, but there is a, there's a little twist to it, which is this one right here. They are not, they don't commute. L, the translation operator for L1 times and multiplied by the translation operator for L2 is not the same as putting the translations in the two. Uh, in the opposite way, you get a, get a phase factor, which is basically the flux through, the, through that plac plaquette L1 uh, by L2. However, if that flux, if it is such that there's an integer number of two pi, if phi is two pi times an integer, then of course they do commute. So if we, which is equivalent to saying that if there's an integer number of flux through the sample, then there's come. If that is the case, then you can simultaneously diagonalize H, T of LX and T of LY, and you can label the states by the eigenvalues of the translation operator, just like in periodic lattices. You know, you know that you have eigenvalues with modulus one, uh, they're just a phase factor, okay. So it is very analogous to crystal momentum in, but you can only do it if there's an, your sample has a size with an integer number of flux quanta through it. Of course, numerically, you can do that. You can choose your sample to have that, okay? Then it turns out you can actually write down an uh, actual, the wave function instead of a, you know, some polynomial in Z times, uh, uh, times the Gaussian factor, uh, you get Jacobi theta functions and those who are mathematically inclined can go play with them as much as they like. But uh, one property that we are going to use, which you can prove using those uh, uh, Jacobi theta functions is that in the actual uh, um, sample, okay, there are precisely as many zeros of this complex wave function as there are flux, as the flux through that sample. So, and moreover, it turns out that if you know the position of the zeros, you can write down the wave function. That's all. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the zeros of the wave complex wave function and the actual functional form of the wave function. Again, the wave function of course depends on the right, right. Getting the analysis, not no, no, it, yeah, no. That's just the flux through the sample. Right. Okay. So we we said let's try and analyze this. What's going on? How you see, I had this idea coming from localization that um, Taulus had this idea that, you know, it, how much the eigenstate and the eigenfunction changes if you change the boundaries from pe being periodic to antiperiodic determines whether it's what the conductance of the eigenstate is. So it tells you something about the localization properties. So the question I asked Dan Orovas, who was a uh, summer student at Bell Labs was, you change the boundary condition, see what the zeros are doing. Can we identify uh, a localized state by saying that the zeros are all localized and identify an extended state in terms of zeros being extended? Extended where? Extended over the sample. And how, how are the zeros going to change? You're gonna change the boundary condition. So what you do is you This is theta x going from zero to two pi, and then theta y, which is from zero to two pi. And you make a grid in here, very fine grid. And you solve the problem for each boundary condition. And for each boundary condition, you have ns zeros. And so you 
somewhere those NS zeros are there. One, two, three, four. Let's say it's four, four eigenstates. Then there are four zeros. Then you go to the next boundary condition, these zeros will move. And you keep doing that, cover this whole uh, boundary condition space up and see what happens to the zeros. And I had this naive idea that if you had an extended say the zeros will go all over the place. And if the uh, eigenstate is not extended, it won't really care about the boundary condition and therefore the zeros will just stick around where they are. So we, in the end, we asked, how do the zeros move when you change the theta x and theta y, which I've written as theta one and theta two in there. And can you identify states which, which are actually extended and carry current and give you the Hall effect? Okay. Now it turns out that actually all these states are, we, we learned as we did the, <laughs> were doing the calculation, that there's a topological quantum number associated with every state. That's called the churn number. And this is an integer quantity, okay? And it turns out that this churn number basically gives you that if you cover this boundary condition space once, how many times have, do the zeros cover the real traverse in the real space? And the integer residue of that is the churn number, it turns out. So we were right, I mean, my thinking was right that if it is an extended state, it, the zeros will move around. But there was a little bit more to it, which I'll show you in the next few slides. Yeah, yeah, right. We know that now, this is 1980, 1980s. So I'm, I'm giving you, in all these lectures, I'm giving a sense of history. You know, we're, we're, we're in this thick of woods and we're trying to figure out our way out. And so, and these are original slides. I, I have not doctored them. I could write much more, you know, very sanitized version of these slides, which will go with today's language, but this was the language of 1980s, okay? The other thing, of course, one knows is that some of the churn numbers of all the eigenstates is one. So the first thing you have, you might ask is, how do you know that there's an, that the, uh, an eigenstate has a fixed churn number? What guarantees that, okay? And I will come to that a little bit later. Uh, let me uh, show you the, put we sort of took one, some random potential and that's the equipotential, okay? The numerically generated, smooth random potential and the contour maps are given there. And, you know, just to give you an idea that this is not some, this are no symmetries whatsoever. It's just, we, this is one example of the thing that we did, okay. And it, it turns out that this size that we were able to do and, and analyze very well only was eight flux quanta at that time, all right? So it's a very small sample. So there are eight zeros and eight eigenfunctions. And what I'm plotting now is the zeros, where, where are the zeros for each eigenstate? So what I've done is basically covered this boundary condition space with a very fine grid. And every, for each of these values of the boundary condition angles, I put down the eight zeros. And then I asked the question, um, what happens as I change the boundary condition? Okay. So unfortunately, this one is not showing it very well, but this one here, uh, this is the highest um, eigenstate and uh, there should be some more zeros in here, but uh, not, showing them. But one of the things that you see very clearly that even if the state is really localized, the, I, the zeros are not completely localized. There's always one strand that comes this way and another one that goes that way. Every one of the eigenstates has that. So that's not a good enough, you know, just saying that the zeros don't move is not, is not, um, is not possible in any of the eigenstates. 
Uh, you can see what happens here. Some of the uh, zeros are sitting in localized and others are moving around, okay? But these, both these eigenstates actually are localized. Yeah, no, they have, they have zeros in real space for any given theta one, theta two. And then I change theta one and theta two, and I ask, how do these zeros move? And these are the figures that they make, okay? And these two states are the highest two state. This is psi eight. No, this is psi five. So it is closer to the center of the band. I'm basically one, two, three, four, up to eight. Let me show you some of the others. This is psi four and this is psi three. Now, unfortunately, these, uh, these are, haven't come out very well in the projection, but you'll have to take my word for it that in this wave function, we cannot get any zero here or there or there. On the other hand, there are these, you can sort of see a little C of little zeros there, there's a C all over. So basically this wave function psi four, I can say, I want a zero here in space and I can manufacture a boundary condition theta x, theta y to get you a zero there. But this one and others, I cannot do that. If you say that I want a zero here, this eigen function will never have a zero there. Similarly, when I go backwards here, this eigenfunction will have no zeros here. This will have no zeros here, et cetera. So we realized that the only way to sort of uh, decide whether an eigenfunction was extended or localized was actually to say that the zeros must be present at any point in space. That is what, is the, that is what an extended state is. So let me tell you, uh, so that's the actual, uh, actual reference, uh, Arovas et al, 88. Uh, first, eigenstates have exactly as many zeros as there are flux quanta through your sample, and they completely specify the wave functions. The second thing that you can prove is that eigenstates do not cross in energy as a function of theta. And the way to see that very clearly is if two eigenvalues are very close to each other, you, um, for some theta x and theta y, um, you can forget about the rest of the eigenvalues. Then you can sort of say one of them is here, the other one is here, and here's delta real plus i delta i, because it's a complex Hermitian matrix. And the only way you're going to get two eigenvalues to cross is this has to be equal. These two must be zero. Delta R must be zero and delta I must be zero. There should be three conditions met. Whereas we have only two parameters, theta X and theta Y. So generically eigen function, eigenvalues will never cross when you change the boundary condition angle. If you change the potential also, then you can make it cross. But we are talking about eigenstates in the given potential. And so all of these eigenstates, they sort of look like, like spaghetti bands as a function of theta x and theta y, just like band structure does, okay? No, all right. And the states then are characterized by a topological winding number. This is something that we learned from after reading papers by David Thaulis, uh, which is, that's an integer, which basically specifies the coverage of the real space torus by the boundary condition torus. What? Right. No, no, they won't because there are only two. Per yes. If you change the potential, yes, they will. But if you fix the potential, they don't. They can't cross. Generically, okay. The other thing that we found that the, the, for the states that had this churn number uh, coverage, 
not equal to zero. And now we know that the churn number is nothing but the angle integrated average all conductance of the sample. And that we found that out <laughs> the hard way, basically. We, we calculated the Hall conductance and then we integrated over the, over the boundary condition angles and we found we're getting numbers like 0 0.99997 and 0.0003 or something like that. And so we realized that basically that, that the integral, the average Hall conductance of any given eigenstate, the fact that they don't cross allows us to identify the eigenstates one, two, and whatever the number of uh, flux quanta there are. And so in some sense, there was a natural association that when the churn number is not zero, it has a finite contribution to the whole conductance. It's certainly the average uh, boundary condition average whole conductance is a non-zero integer. And you have itinerant zeros and we identified those states as extended and those that had churn number zero were localized. Um, I mean, um, you're, you're, yeah, you're right. I understand that this is a continuum problem case. Right, exactly right. So you could probably do that in, the, in that case too. Yeah, absolutely. With a disorder potential, right. Yeah, it won't be momentum. <laughs> you have to do the super cell. Yeah, yeah. Okay, anyway, so that's um, again, um, just writing out that the uh, whole conductance is a velocity velocity correlation function and its average value in units of E squared over H is an integer, okay? So basically um, that's where it sat, sat from 88 to 92 when I moved to Princeton. I, my first graduate student, Yan Ho, I told him, let's, let's try and figure out where these churn not zero states are in the band, okay? And um, in particular, if we increase the size of the system, what happens to them? Where are they in energy space? And of course, you don't want to look at just one sample. You want to look at an ensemble average because that's the only thing that makes sense when you're talking about a disorder problem is that you want to see the, what is the density of states of churn zero states and what is the density of states of churn non-zero states. And I'm going to show you that data next, okay? That's basically uh, the work that uh, my first graduate student, Yan Huo, uh, did at Princeton. We asked, where are these non-zero churn number states? How many of these states are non-zero? If we have a certain size of the system with n eigenstates, how, how many of them are going to be non-zero churn and how many are going to be zero? Now, in those days, the assumption was that there was only one state with, with a non-trivial churn number. So the assumption was that if you had n eigenstates, one in each sample, there will be one state which, ha which has churn number equal to one and all the other eigenstates have churn number zero. Certainly was true for that sample with eight eigenstates. Only one had churn number one and the others were all zero. So that's a very small sample. Okay. And then I will use the same method of calculating churn numbers and seeing where eigenstates are to understand something called floating of extended states at low magnetic field, and also talk about 2D electrons in a random magnetic field. So those are the other two uh, problems I want to do. So here's the original uh, work that was done. Um, uh, what is plotted here is the density of states of all states with a sample with eight flux quanta and another sample uh, with an with ensemble of samples with eight flux quanta each. And on the right is the density at the top is the density of states uh, for 128 flux quanta. So I think most of you can see that there's no, 
not much change in the density of state. There's no finite size correction to the density of states that's really discernible, uh, even down to eight flux quanta. Okay. Maybe somewhere in the tails there are some issues, but at least the central part looks very much the same. The next thing we did was find out what's the density of churn not equal to zero. And we didn't sort of restrict ourselves to one or minus one or two or plus minus two, et cetera. Because all that is required is the sum of the churn numbers has to be equal to one. So if there's only a single state with churn number, then it has to be plus one. And it, there would be only uh, uh, one for each sample. But what you find here is actually that the churn non-zero states are clustered around the center of the band. And they get clustered more, more and more narrowly as the size of the system goes up. So what I'm trying to say is that this width is significantly more than that width. And both widths are much smaller than the width of the total density of states, half width of the total density of states. So you can say, well, let's try and plot the width as a function of size of the system. And that's what we did here. The width plotted against the number of flux quanta on a log-log plot. And it seems we tried two different kinds of random potential. One is Gaussian white noise. The other one is short range scatterers that have been sprinkled. And while the actual numbers, of course, differ because they, you know, the two, potentials are very different. Um, and what we find is that the slopes of the two lines is pretty much the same. And the slope is 0.21. Now, if you remember the, the slope of the curves in, in uh, the experiments was 0.42. So that's very suggestive that there's something going on here, which is there's some relationship maybe between this X that I have and the uh, kappa that the experiments got, okay? So what's the argument? Okay, basically what we're saying is that, that this X is measuring the localization length exponent. And the argument is the following. First of all, the data are consistent. It's not saturating. In those days, uh, there were people who claimed that there was an extended band because some people did some Hartree-Fock theory and stuff like that, and, and they were claiming that there was an extended state band and all that sort of stuff. So this shows very clearly that the data are consistent with this width going to zero in the thermodynamic limit. So there's only one critical energy, which is at the center of the band, because we have chosen the, um, chosen the problem to be electron hole symmetric. White noise is equally positive and negative. And when we put short range scatterers, we put equal positive and negative amplitude scatterers, statistically equal number. Okay. Now, what do we expect the width of this churn, non-zero churn band to be? And the argument is that we expect that if we have a finite size system, we expect that if the localization length is of the order of the length of the system or bigger, then the system cannot distinguish whether it is localized or extended. So the localization length at some energy, delta E, whenever it gets to be equal to L, that will be the width of my churn band, the churn non-zero states. So if I assume that psi varies as energy to the minus nu, that is just uh, exactly this formula right there, then that tells me that delta E must go as L to the minus one over nu, because I'm putting that equal to L. And so it must go as number of flux quanta to the minus one over two nu. So if X is 0.21, then I can get nu from there it's equal to one over two X or one over 4.42, which is 2.4 with an error bar of 0.1. That's what we figured. So it's very small sizes compared to the data that was, that has been generated for these widths because we have 
number of flux quanta eight to 128. So if you want to sort of think about it, it's basically, you know, three by three to 11 by 11 or something like that. That's the size of the system, very small sizes. And uh, the data get 2.4. And actually, as you can see, the number has gone up when they did a better job of analyzing their data. We are already getting a number that is higher than that, somewhat higher, although it's within the error bars. So I'm not going to make any claim for that. But if I'd used those kind of widths in my strips, I would have not even got a scaling function problem. It would have had wrong behavior at small energies. And how about the number of non-zero churn states? We can also count how many of them there are. And because the width is shrinking and the height is roughly remaining the same, we expect that actually that number will be sub thermodynamic So if you look at this, this plot, it is roughly um, uh, n, to, n to the 0.79. It's one minus that 0.21 that we had for the other one, okay? So it's saying that there is not one topological state for large sizes. It's a sub thermodynamic. In fact, the number of topological states as the sample size goes to infinity goes to infinity also, but not as fast as the sample number or size goes. So it's sub thermodynamic. And in fact, the sub thermodynamic tells you that there is a localization length that is diverse. No, there is no, no proof of that, but people thought that that's what, because, because it is happening at one energy, they thought it was a specific and eigenstate, but that's not true. It's, it's, it's states within a small energy window around the center, and that energy window is going to zero in the thermodynamic limit, but it is finite. And, and how it's determined is basically by saying that for a finite size system, the localization length at that energy scale is exactly equal to the length of the sample. Okay. Much better work was done by another uh, student or one of my students, uh, Chong, uh, only a few couple of years ago. He did it both for the continuum model as well as for, the, for a lattice model. Okay, just to check whether it was, it was different for a lattice model with flux threaded through it. And again, we are plotting the number of churn not equal to zero states with this number of flux quanta. Double logarithmic plot going from flux quanta about, you know, 12 to over 2000, 2500, I think it is in both cases. So it's a factor of 20 in flux quanta or factor of five in length scales roughly. And of course he is now doing some um, statistical analysis of the data and then getting error bars based on that. I have suspicion about that. Because I, don't, I don't like using law of large numbers so easily. But anyway, this is, these are the numbers that he, he gets. Don't touch. Um, NC versus N, this is 2.49 plus minus 0.01 for this set of samples. I don't, you know, don't take this 0.01 too seriously, nor should you take that other 0.02 too seriously. They're, the two should be the same. So clearly, <laughs> if I took it really seriously, I would say the error bars don't overlap. Uh, my, my own uh, thing is, if someone gives you a very low error bar multiplied by three, if they give you a conservative error bar multiplied by two, then you're probably in roughly right, okay? So I, I would say that this is suggesting that it is, I mean, between those two, you can fit the, both of them by saying it's 2.47 plus minus 0.03, but I would say, I, I don't think it's 0.03. It's not 1% accuracy. It's probably two to 3% accuracy. Now, whether one should make a big deal about the fact that this is not equal to the one there, um, I don't know, but I, I do think that this, the fact that for very, very small sizes, it was 2.4 with an error bar of 0.1. And now we've got all these big sizes and we still haven't changed that much is within the same error bar, okay? 
It is telling, I mean, I have more faith in this than the other one. And the other reason I say that is because, sorry, if you look at this curve, okay, on, on this log log plot, it really looks straight. I mean, you, I mean, I, I tend to look at it from sideways and see whether there's any curvature in the, in the plot to see if there are corrections or not. And we also did put in corrections, okay? And when you put in corrections, you find that whatever corrections you put in are quantitatively very small. So you put in two extra parameters, a coefficient and an extra exponent, okay? And you do the best job of fitting everything. Of course, new changes a little bit, but not, a, not all the way to 2.6. It changes by like a one or two in the last digit. And the reason it does that is because the coefficient of the second term is very small and the exponent, the, the subleading exponent is large. So it's minus two or minus 1.5 or something like that. When, whereas if you look at the, the analysis of the strip method, it's 0.4 or 0.2. Okay, so that it's saying that there are lots of corrections in these uh, strip method. And here it doesn't look like there's that many corrections. So this is a mystery which needs to be solved. Uh, I'm not going to claim that this is the right answer, uh, but I, I think that this needs to be looked at. And these are the, that on the right at the top are the density of states for different sizes. Okay. And I think he has done, um, I'm not, don't quite remember this, but these are you know, thousands and tens of thousands of samples averaged. Actually, one of my other students in the early 90s, very soon after Yan Ho, my second student, Muyu, um, um, actually did the same kind of stuff for Taoist conductance as a function of energy and size. So basically what you're doing is you're finding out uh, the eigenstates for periodic boundary condition, and then you make it anti-periodic boundary condition and see how much the eigenvalues move relative to the average spacing of eigenvalues. And that defines the Taoist conductance, if you remember the formula from um, lecture two. And so he plotted the Taoist conductance. Um, it's called the RMS. For some reason, he decided he didn't like taking an absolute value. So he squared it up and, and took the average and square rooted it and things like that. But again, the same thing that it is collapsing near the center of the band, saying that the, the, that the in the thermodynamic limit, the conductance is only finite at the center of the band where there's an ex, where the di, localization and diverges everywhere else. The conductance is going to zero because they are localized states. And by plotting the width as a function of n, he's able to get that. And the slope is again 0 0.21, suggesting somewhere around 2.4. Again, I don't know the error bar here, but it's sort of comparable. So what I'm trying to say is that there are different ways of uh, doing numerics to get an answer. And I think it's very useful to have a situation where there are two very different methods to get the same answer. Then you can, if they give the same result, you can trust it. So. To the extent that 2.47 or 49 and 2.58 or whatever it is that is the, the latest number are, you know, they're certainly within 5% um, within of each other. So we can certainly trust that answer to 5%, but we, I don't know whether we can trust it to 1%, not just yet. So another thing that you can do using these churn number methods, basically identifying what are the, what are the extended or current carrying states in, in the quantum Hall regime, is you can try and understand the crossover to low magnetic field. So let me try and um, motivate that. Uh, in lecture two, when we didn't have any magnetic field, just a two dimensional electron gas with potential scattering, uh, one of the um, results of the scaling theory was that there is no metallic phase. It, it flows to insulator, okay? And for small, uh, for large conductance, you can develop a perturbation theory, which, uh, which is 
uh, basically here, it's given by the beta function, the uh, logarithmic derivative of the conductance with length scale is uh, given by d minus two minus some constant over universal constant over g. And for d equals two, you just, the first term vanishes. So you can just write down the conductance as a function of length. And we did that in lecture two and showed that the conductance at a large length scale is the conductance at the microscopic length scale minus uh, um, a universal number multiplied by the log of uh, capital L over L. Okay. And of course, um, uh, G at the, at, the, at the microscopic length, which is the mean free path is just the true result, which in two dimensions is E squared over two pi H bar times KFL. And KFL is supposed to be very large. You're talking about a metal with very few defects. So the mean free path is supposed to be very long, whereas inverse KF, that is the uh, uh, De Broglie wavelength is microscopic, okay? So KFL is a very large number. So one expects the G, little, G of little l is quite big and it'll take quite a long length before the logarithm is going to catch over and make that thing zero. So if you sort of say that, well, at some length scale C, the conductance becomes vanishingly small using this low you know, perturbative result, you find immediately that C is just put capital L equal to C and, and put the left-hand side equal to zero and you'll get C equals L exponential of pi KFL over two. And since KFL is supposed to be much bigger than one, pi over two KFL is also very much bigger than one and its exponential is exponentially large. So basically it's saying that you for weak disorder, you have very long length scale uh, localization lengths, but they are low, every state is localized, even though they're localized over long length scale. So let's try and understand how these Landau levels, when you go to low field, what happens to them? So that is drawn, uh, I, uh, hand drawn figure that I made uh, two days ago is basically, if I look at the energy versus magnetic field, then each of the Landau levels is at n plus one half h bar omega c. Omega c is proportional to h. So they're just straight lines going through the origin, okay? So these are the energies of the lowest Landau level as a function of field. This is the energy of the second Landau level uh, or first Landau. This is the zero, this is the first, this is the second, et cetera, et cetera. They, this, this is known as the Landau fan diagram basically. And I've, I've sort of put hashes there to say that there, it's really broadened by disorder, okay? Which a disorder doesn't depend on magnetic field. So the width is the same. So when the splitting between these Landau levels gets to be of order of the, um, uh, order of the disorder width, uh, something else will happen. Now, one of the things that was pointed out by Melnitsky and also by Laughlin was that we know that there is a, extended critical energy inside each of these Landau levels where the localization length goes to infinity. We just saw numerical evidence of that. So what happened to those infinite localization length? We know that out at zero field, all the states at finite energy are localized. Even if they have exponentially large localization length, they're still localized, which means the only way that can happen is that this middle of the band, which is which is this extended states, those turn not equal to zero state, they must be going up to infinite energy as you go to uh, zero field. That's the only resolution of that. They carry a topological quantum number that cannot be, uh, uh, you know, they all have plus one. Plus one, plus one never gets to zero. In a, in a tight binding model, of course, what happens is that there are there are negative churn number subbands which will which will cancel the things. But nevertheless, this was the idea that if you are very close to a free electron problem, you should see some floating of these critical energies. So we actually tried to do that, and we did that. This is with Kuniang, who was my postdoc, um, and what we did was we actually did a. Um, 
a tight binding model. And in this tight binding model, um, it has a central band and two side bands. And you can think of the two side bands as Landau levels. Basically, this is the first Landau level. And, uh, and what happens is that you should think uh, that um, this is zero, uh, the lowest Landau level, and that's infinite energy, and that's on the other side of infinity. Uh, if you, you can make more subbands if you want, but the, the data are most conclusive when you have just one Landau level in this problem, okay? And so this is the density of states of all states um, at a disorder strength of W equals one in some units. And this is at disorder strength of 2.5. And the lower panels tell you the density of churn not equal to zero states. And what you find is of course, for small disorder, the um, churn not equal to zero states are in the middle of the Landau band. So I'm trying to say that this one is at the cent in the middle of that guy. It's got a slightly smaller width than that. But when you go to this larger disorder, what you find is that this, um, this energy is actually not the same as the energy of the full of the lowest band. In fact, it's quite a bit higher, it's somewhere there. So the critical energy, which is represented by churn not equal to zero states are actually floating relative to the rest of the band. So, the, so there is evidence of this floating that was conjectured by uh, Kmelnitsky and by, by Laughlin. So that's another way, another thing that you can use this method for, okay. And you can actually scale the number of extended states. Uh, I don't want to go through that. Uh, that you can do a full scaling of, of this. Uh, and again, all the data sort of depending on the localization length gives you the right, um, right uh, um, you know, gives you one single scaling plot and that depends on the exponent that you used and best is achieved with exponent of 2.3, okay? Here, the error bars are much larger because you can see it's a little bit more messy. It's not as clean as a single Landau level. And, you know, okay. Finally, I want to just mention one more problem that you can do because you can do numerics is you put a random field and then ask yourself how many states are, uh, so this is a sy system in which you take a tight binding model, you put fields up and down equal with equal probability. And then you calculate the churn number of each of the eigenstates and you see how many non-zero churn states there are as a function of the total number of states for different energies and different disorder strengths. And what you find, uh, the upshot of this is that the best data collapse seems to suggest that there are two branches to this curve, not one. Unlike the case of uniform magnetic field, suggesting that there's at least the data are more consistent with there being an actual extended band. Okay. Now, there is a um, very valid theoretical reason to believe that to treat this numerical result with suspicion. And therefore, I also want to um, you know, show that you shouldn't just take numerical data at face value. It turns out that if you have random magnetic field, then you do the beta function, you get one over G squared instead of one over G. And that says that the localization length, instead of being exponential in KFL, are actually exponential of KFL squared. So they're huge. So the kind of sizes we can do are tiny compared to the supposed uh, you know, localization lengths that you would expect in this problem using the field theoretic or scaling kind of analysis. So it is quite, you know, it's not unlikely that something that diverges so rapidly at the, at, at the at zero energy looks like a, as if it's diverging with a finite localization land, I mean, finite power law divergence at a finite energy, which is what this is suggesting. So you have to take that with a pinch of salt, uh, better numeric, has to be done. I don't know whether that has been done since, you know, this, uh, this was 25 years ago. So, uh, but I don't think anybody is really, uh, when, when you see that the length scale is growing so rapidly um, 
as a numerical person, you have to sort of say that this is not the problem that numerics is going to solve. This is going to have to be solved using analytic arguments. And the numeric can only help the analytic arguments. It, they cannot, uh, no, they cannot uh, um, you know, be the primary way to. But on the other hand, if you want to look at the localization length in a, in a, a finite magnetic field in a Landau level problem, they are certainly very good uh, at getting that. Okay. And with that, I want to finish for today. And I will continue uh, tomorrow with uh, talking about um, fractional quantum Hall effect to localization transition, and then finally many body localization for an interacting system. So tomorrow, I'm sorry, Thursday's lecture, the final one is going to be about interacting electrons and how, what numerics has to contribute to that. I, my own feeling is, uh, well, graphene has uh, both plus and minus. Yeah. So, so I think that, that would be, that would suggest that it's, uh, um, um, I mean, it, it sort of depends a little bit on what the churn numbers of each of the uh, Landau bands are, right? Because uh, uh, in, for the simple parabolic case, they are all plus one. Uh, with uh, Dirac dispersion, the central one is uh, is different. And uh, if if they are all positive churn number states, then of course there's no way to um, cancel them without getting them to plus or minus infinity in energy. Um, but you know, if you realize that all of these things are actually in a um, in a lattice, so we are only talking about physics on the length scale of the magnetic length, which is, which is on the order of 70 to 100 angstroms, whereas lattice constant is two angstroms, right? The nearest neighbor distance. If you start with a tight binding problem, then what happens is, um, and let me not talk about graphene, let me just talk about ordinary gall gallium arsenide or something like that, but I assume that the band curvature changes at the Birma zone edge. And then I ask myself the question, what, what is the Landau level structure of that? What you find is you get positive plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. And then there's a central band and then there's plus one from the other end. And then there's a central band that has exactly the negative churn number of the sum of all the others. And so what happens when you put disorder is the central band tends to broaden and come down and eat up the churn numbers of all the bands. So I think it is probably true that the lowest, at least in the, in the normal case, P squared over 2M, the lowest Landau levels do levitate, but maybe not the others. I mean, before they levitate, they get eaten up by the... Um, well, I don't know if you strictly talk about the continuum, it's a, it's a singular limit. That's the problem, right? Um, uh, I don't know about the graphene. I haven't thought about it, but that's a really interesting problem. Right. So if I don't do it at say zero B value, right, but a small B value, right, right. Uh, so what is what is the crossover state? Okay, let me think about that. Um, it will depend on um, if the, my guess is it actually go from KFL squared to KFL because uh, if, the, if the randomness is large and that's the first physics that you're gonna see. And then when you go, and you get to length scale such that, that it starts perceiving that little magnetic, mean magnetic field, then I think you will see the physics of quantum hall. So that's probably what it's going to do. But uh, 
at the sizes that we are doing uh, in <laughs> well, numerically, we, we are probably never going to see that, that little thing. Yeah, you have to always figure out whether something is numerically feasible or not. But what you're saying is exactly right. You have to look at the crossover length scale by doing some approximations as to what kind of behavior you should get. What are the corrections you do random field? What are the corrections you do due to uniform field? And then estimate the length scale that where the corrections are going to be equal. And if that length scale is too big, then you know, you're out of luck. That's, uh, yeah, numerics is not very good when, when you have to go to length scale that are, you know, 100 or 1000 or something like that. It's, uh, then, then you're playing with. Yeah, so. I assume it is the same. I, I have not, uh, uh, I have not uh, seen data, I must confess. Uh, I've been mostly working with interacting <laughs> like everybody else. So I, do, I, don't, I haven't followed what the non-interacting people are doing in the case of graphene. Yeah, it's, uh, but it's certainly, uh, you know, there must be papers of that kind, definitely. Okay. Any questions from... from the Zoom people. Don't think so. So in that case, let's uh, stop. All right.